Welcome to Senate Education on Thursday, March 24th at 3.40. Uh, we have with us uh, Donna Russo-Savage. I haven't seen you in a long time. Hope you're doing well. You're, you're, yeah, you can't hear you. Out there. Yeah. There we go. Sorry about that. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. It's really great to see you. Thank you. It's nice to see see you sort of as well. Yeah, sort of. Uh, so we are, we thought we would have you talk to us a little bit about Act 46 and give yes. us some background. We have, uh, you know, I'm a new chair, but was involved in it. We, we have a couple of new senators that weren't involved in it. And just an overview of Act 46 would be really helpful before we dig into this, the House bill. I'd be happy to. Um, this is Donna Russo Savage. I'm with the Agency of Education. Um, and I did know that this is what you'd like me to talk about. I'd also like to explain because it leads into it why now is a, is a really important time to make these proposed amendments to chapter 11. And I do have um, some written testimony because I knew I would need to go through this really quickly and you might want to look at it in more detail. So I'll send that to your committee assistant um, later today. Um, before I begin, and I know that your legislative council is going to go into more detail about this because it's a really significant aspect of the changes to Chapter 11. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page with a couple of um, a couple of terms, and that is um, the first one is a union school district, um, and and there are so many terms that are similar as you know, but a union school district is a district that is organized to provide for the education of children who reside in more than one town. There are a couple of different kinds of union school districts, but they all are union school districts. Um, one, one type is a union high school district or a union elementary school districts, and they're organized to provide for the education of students only in a small subset of grades. And then they have member school districts at the town level who are responsible for the other grades. The other kind of union school district is a un unified union school district or a UUSD. And um, a UUSD is responsible for all grades pre-K through 12. And although it's similar in many ways, what is distinctly different and is part of the reason that the chapter 11 um, proposals are being made, it does not have member school districts. And that one factor makes many of the operational um, processes just different. And it, it makes, it raises a lot of questions because there isn't a local school board to perform certain duties or to, to stand in a certain place in relation to the union school district. So, so in most of the, and I'll get into this in more detail, but most of the districts now are unified union school districts, which are the, um, the ones for pre-K through 12. So Act 46 is often used as a, um, as a convenient way to refer to all of the activity that has occurred in the last few years regarding the creation of unified union school districts. But actually the legislature started this activity several years before it enacted um, Act 46. In, in 2010, it enacted Act 153. And in Act 153, the legislature created a program to try to encourage districts to have these conversations and then to, um, um, and then to merge hopefully into a, a unified union school district. And the program included certain tax rate reductions and other transitional assistance and, um, and incentives to encourage districts to do so. Then in 2012, it expanded that program in Act 1, uh, or you all expanded that program in, um, in Act 156. And then in 2013, you amended these even some more in Act 56. There was some activity under this program that was initially established in 2010. Um, several groups of communities did come together and, and form study committees to study whether it made sense to form a unified union school district. And um, uh, there actually were two uh, union school districts that were created under this under under that those programs that were um, enacted earlier. In 
2015, I believe that the legislature was um, not sat was not satisfied, didn't believe that those earlier programs had really resulted in the, the number of changes that they had been anticipating. And so the legislators at that time enacted Act 46. And Act 46 is really an extension of the earlier program, but it, um, all, and also added some additional factors. So the first thing that Act 46 did was actually pull that earlier legislation into itself and say, you know, and also expand upon that earlier legislation by having a program that, depending upon what criteria was met, um, a group of districts that voluntarily created a unified union school district would get, depending, again, depending upon the criteria, differing levels of tax rate reductions and transitional assistance and, and incentives. Um, the second phase of, of what Act 50, 46 did, and this is what's different than the next three phases are what's different than the earlier um, uh, legislation. Uh, it said that any district that hadn't merged by a certain time and didn't expect to be merged by a certain time needed to self-evaluate its current practices against the same criteria that was used to determine whether uh, a merger was a good idea in the first place. And Act 46 had listed certain uh, educational and um, financial goals that, that, that the legislators were hoping to achieve um, by, this, by, this, um, by this legislation. So this, this second phase had these non-merging districts evaluate themselves against these same standards and then, and then present a proposal that explained why it is that continuing in the way that they were currently operating was the best way in their particular situation to achieve those goals. So then, the, that, and then th those proposals were sent initially to the Secretary of Education. The third part of Act 46, was the Secretary of Education read all those proposals, did additional research, uh, met with representatives of the school boards of every one of those um, um, districts that was making the proposal to stay the same. And then the legislation required the secretary to create a statewide proposed plan for what should happen. You know, did, did they make their case, did these proposals make their case um, and should they stay the same or should some of them actually be merged into, into um, merged districts, into unified union school districts? Um, then the fourth and final phase was that um, the, um, the, the State Board of Education um, read the secretary's proposal, read all of the proposals from all of the various um, districts who were sending in their proposals to stay the same, had meetings around the, the meetings I don't believe were required in statute, but the state board did hold meetings around the state to meet with the representatives from the districts that wanted to stay the same. And then as required by Act 46, the state board issued an order that did indeed require merger in certain cases and in other cases said, okay, what you're saying makes sense or we can't see anything that would be better, so stay the same. Um, and then, as you probably know, um, many of those um, uh, districts that had been merged by the state board's order brought, a loss, brought law, several lawsuits. The um, state Supreme Court ultimately decided that the state board had been properly granted the authority by the legislature to do what it did and that it had exercised that, that uh, authority appropriately and that the order could stand. So that's really, really fast <laughs> version of what's happened in, in 10 years. Um, so I'll give you, I wanna give you a couple of statistics because these are important just to know how much change occurred. And I'm gonna try to share my screen, although I'm a little scared that I'm gonna do something screwy. So I'll do my best. Um, as of July 1, 2019, which is the date on which all voluntarily merged or state board created unified union school districts, were required to be operational. So that's just like a really good point to, to have a cutoff to see what had happened. Um, voters in 161 districts residing in 145 towns 
had voluntarily approved the formation of 39 unified districts. So that was a net reduction of 122 districts by, by that, that voluntary phase. The state board then was faced with um, addressing 96 unmerged districts. Part of the reason it's, if you add things up, it's not gonna come up to all of, of the districts that were then in the state. And that's because Act 46 specifically exempted certain types of districts. If the districts were very large like Burlington um, or um, if um, uh, it was an interstate um, school district, which is subject to federal law. And so it just, it, it's they're very often just kind of over there on their own in, instead of being included in, in legislation like this. So ultimately after the voluntary mergers and those exemptions, the state board had 96 unmerged districts to, to look at and to consider. Um, its order did not change the governance structure of 47 of those 96 districts. And it did merge 46 districts in 41 towns to form 11 new union school districts. Those 11 school districts were seven new unified union school districts. So that was pre-K through 12 and four that were responsible either for pre-K through eight or pre-K through six. And the reason that was done was because the structure of the various schools didn't allow for them to be able to merge pre-K through 12. Uh, the state board also enlarged two existing um, union school districts by adding another district in, into them. So you can see there was a great deal of change that occurred over a couple of years, but most of it really hit everything on July 1 of 2019. Um, and, and it's because of those changes and because there is a very distinct difference between a union high school district and, and, and when I say Union High School District, just think Union Elementary School District too, um, and a Unified Union School District. Structurally, they're different because, because the Unified Union School District doesn't have um, a, a, a member school district at the other, for the other grades. Um, so it, it's because of these reasons that it's important that, that these Chapter 11 changes are made. And I just want to Explain, and I'm hoping I can bring this up. Maybe I won't bother it. I'm just, I'm not very technological and I don't want to take your time trying to figure it out. Um, but prior to 2010, only 20% of all school districts in Vermont were a unified school district of any type. So 20% of all school districts in the state in 2010 were some kind of a union school district. And almost all of those, that 20%, um, were union high school districts. In fact, in 2010, there were only two districts in the state that operated all grades pre-K through 12 uh, that were union school districts. In contrast, in 2022, 50% of all school districts in the state are union school districts and nearly 84% of those 50% are unified union school districts. So there's just been a huge increase in the number of unified union school districts in the state. Um, so when the legislature enacted Acts 153 and 46 and all of the other related um, ones creating this, these programs to either incentivize or require merger, um, they didn't, it, it, it was just a, a program to try to encourage or require it. It wasn't language to, for the process at all. And all of, all of this legislation relied upon the statutes that are set out in chapter 11, um, both for the, create, the exploration and creation of a new union school district, but also once created the operation of a union school district. And, that, that set of statutes, chapter 11, um, in chapter 11, were enacted in, late, in the late 1960s. And they've been hardly amended since then. Very few amendments have, done, have, have occurred in, in the interim. Um, as we were helping um, school districts both to explore the potential creation of union school districts during the voluntary phase of Act, 40, Act 46 and the other um, related um, uh, legislation. Um, and since then, since 2019 in particular, when we've been trying to help 
um, guide unified union school districts to try to figure out how to operate as a unified union school district. Um, it's become, it became really very clear to the agency that chapter 11 is very poorly drafted, um, doesn't include a lot of detail, includes details about the same topic in several locations and you have to know like where to go among all these different locations to try to piece together. And then probably most significant, does, well, first of all, does, also doesn't um, even address certain topics. And then finally, and, and what's most significant here is that it was written for union high school districts. And even though there were some attempts made in later years to try to make it make sense for unified union school districts, very often it, it just doesn't. So we have a situation where nearly half of all districts in the state are trying to get used to this new structure, which is a big change anyway. And they're looking mm -hmm. to statutes that essentially give them no help in trying to figure out what they're supposed to do. So beginning in 2019, um, the agency met with a number of people that we felt like un understood the issues and would have good things to contribute. So we, we, met with, we began meeting with the um, elections division at the Secretary of State's office, with the school boards association, the superintendent's association. Um, I believe that we reached out to the teachers union, but there wasn't as, you know, as much to be thinking about in terms of teachers in this, in this particular statute, and, and they did not participate to any great degree. Um, and then also to a number of private attorneys who had been involved in um, uh, advising study committees while they were trying to merge, and then who now also represent unified union school districts. And we developed, we, we first started off with, okay, if we could start with from square one, not changing the law, but trying to make a structure that makes sense so that people can go where they want and find the information they need in order to be able to operate on a day-to-day -day basis. And I mean, it's simple things like, if you want to nominate, if you want to submit a petition for someone to run for the school board, where do you bring the petition? There isn't a local school district where you can, you know, bring it there. It's, it's, you do you bring it to the to the unified union school district clerk who you know might be in some other town or do you bring it to your town clerk or so there are you know many de little tiny details like that that just permeate the whole process of how do you create a union school district but also how do you operate it what we came up with was in large part what is has been included as the the house bill Although they went through it very carefully and um, and with with ledge council and you know made changes throughout, we tried to only make technical changes that would um, that would you know that would expand upon what is there or that would take from existing municipal law or common practice and and to create this this much more comprehensive set of statutes. Anytime that something was um, really went into a policy realm, even if it wasn't something that we felt was particularly controversial, we didn't make we didn't make any changes, and we just kept a list of all of the things that we felt were policy choices. In most part, those were not controversial. They're things like um, a, an amount was set for a, for a certain purpose in 1968 that was twenty five thousand dollars. Is that the right amount now? You know, should that amount be changed? That wasn't something that we were going to get into, but we listed that in the in the policy considerations. The one big area of um, that is controversial, and we again did not draft anything. This this group, the agency of ed, and and this group did not draft anything is about withdrawal from an existing union school district, and that's because the the statute, especially for unified union school districts, is so deficient and has so many chicken and egg problems that um, anything we would have done would have changed it so dramatically that it just would have gone beyond anything we felt as though we, we should be even thinking about doing. Um, because it had some experience, um, recent experience, trying to, uh, to, to, to deal with its portions of of the withdrawal process, the State Board of Education did decide that it wanted to propose something. And the secretary authorized me to work with the State Board and I helped them draft 
a proposal re relating to withdrawal. Um, uh, the, the House accepted some of that proposal, but based on testimony that it received both from citizens in communities that wanted to withdraw and from the school boards association and, you know, various people who came into the community, into the committee, um, there are, there are significant portions of the, uh, of what is in H27 for withdrawal that are different from what the, the, the state board suggested. So I'm sorry, that was an awful lot and very fast. I know I speak very quickly, but I was hoping that if you had questions, there would be time for questions. <laughs> so I, I guess I'm just looking, does that give, give everyone a good sense of what Act 46 was and yeah. is and the grades were? Okay. And I am, I am happy to come back or to be available to, you know, to do anything that would be helpful to you. I feel, I feel very strongly that, that this legislation is necessary because there are so many districts out there that don't have any guidance and I would be very happy to help in any way I can. Thank you, Senator. Yeah, thank you, Donna. I would be interested in the future to learn what the differences were on the withdrawal recommendation from the board and what the house ended up with. Okay, um, I can work with legislative council and yeah, um, that that we'd be happy. I'd be happy to do that. Or if it's more appropriate, if she thinks it's more appropriate, coming from her, we'll 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 get that to you. You got that. You got that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, will there be a review session before the exam on this? <laughs> <laughs> I hope you were taking notes. Be a course three credits. <laughs> yeah. Anything else uh, for Donna before we jump into this for probably the next forty five minutes? Well, Okay. 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 Thank you, Donna. Great to see you. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Is it okay if I stay on just to listen? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Please. please. Thank you. Okay, Ms. St. James. Yeah. So we everybody has a paper copy uh, on their desk. I believe I have more than one. I don't know. Oh, yes. Thank you. What, oh, which one do we look at? What do we do? What's the difference? We have which one do we, we have? Yep. Draft so, um, that's St. James, Office of Legislative Council. What we will be working with is the 114 pages today. That's okay. chunk one. Yeah. So you have chunk one, one and you have the entire bill entire together. Oh, and then tomorrow, you. Daphne will print out chunk two for you. And then whenever we do chunk three. Okay. Um, okay. But if you if you want reference to anything um, that's in chunks two or three, you have the whole bill there today. Quiz on chunk one tomorrow? Um, you know, I would fill that quiz, I think. So I'm certainly not going to have you take that quiz. No. Um, I will say that um, Donna and I... Uh, Pretty much appeared at every um, every every time the house took testimony on this um, from either one of us. We were usually both there to provide support to each other. Just as an uh, that's how we worked uh, to get the, to this place. Um, happy to continue to do that at the committee's discretion or direction to continue to work that closely with um, Donna and AOE or, you know, whatever. Whatever is most comfortable for you and however, you know, you feel uh, you can best effectively get your work done. Great. Yeah, yeah whatever works. Um, Donna has been working with this for almost three years. Yeah. I've had about three months. Yeah. So, um, so we've yeah. had three minutes. <laughs> there we go. We're, we're all at varying degrees of competency here. So you're going to give us 45 minute overview if even that uh we're going to step it up uh 445 um on s on, on the first chunk yep okay great and i need to see uh secretary Bloomer at some point but when i step out just keep, keep going. going yeah okay. and the uh, center of will take over okay mm -hmm. so the first chunk is titled chapter 11 main rewrite this is the portion that Donna was talking about. She convened the stakeholder group with the Secretary of State's office, the private bar, the school boards association. This is what they were working on starting in, I think, 2019, she said. This does not include the controversial piece she was talking about, withdrawals. That's chunk two. Okay. Chunk three is the session law that was um, 
uh, put forward, I believe the original proposal came from the State Board of Education, and then there were significant changes to it in house ed um, to address withdrawals currently underway. That's chunk three. So what you're what we're going to look at today in this chunk one is what Donna has kind of referred to as kind of the non-controversial technical changes um, with, and I will flag them when we get to them, some um, uh, limited and very focused policy decisions that were made. Um, the Agency of Education um, prepared a policy consideration document related to this piece of legislation that House Ed went over. Um, I would encourage you to ask Donna to give that to you if you're interested in seeing the places that AOE had identified uh, as places House Ed went through and made policy changes, but they didn't make changes in everywhere that was suggested. Um, so um, just a pitch to get your hands on that document. Can you just define third chunk? Third chunk is the withdrawal, it's the session law. Oh, it's session law. Session okay. law. So the withdrawal is number two, but the session law for does the session law is for withdrawals that are currently underway. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks. Both are withdrawals. One Correct. underway, yeah. one is Correct. Two, two happening. And the session law addresses the withdrawals that are currently underway are all in different um, phases. Yeah. Oh, so wonderful. there's different, yeah. <laughs> there's different <laughs> session law. There's and they're they're compared to this, um, they're short. Um, so the session law address, there's, there's four different sections to address the four different phases that people are currently in, but it's all related to withdrawal. So chunks two and three are all related to withdrawal. Chunk one is um, exploration. Are we interested in doing this? Okay, we're interested in doing it. Formation, how do we form it? Okay, we've done it. Now, how do we operate it? And it's a lot. So I will say um, uh, for Tuesday, I think I sent Daphne. So I don't know if it's been reposted for today. Has it been reposted for today, the outline? OK. Um, I did not redo it um, per chunk, but I did um, give an outline for the entire bill itself, annotated with page numbers, um, just as a reference um, going forward. Also posted today is a little handout um, with visuals on union school districts. What's it called? It's, I think it's called union school district. Is it term? District. School district. Common term. Okay. okay. Just as oh, a refresher, yeah. if you need to go to it to remember the difference between a union <clears throat> elementary or um, in high school or unified union school district. Are you all okay on that? Do you wanna just breeze through that? You don't wanna go over that in detail? Okay. The only other thing I, I um, would like to go over before we dig into the actual language of the bill is the concept of board proportionality, which is another document that Daphne has posted. Um, school board member proportionality. So this is a concept that will come up um, throughout this rewrite. And it's related to how do we get proportional representation on these new school boards that we're forming? Because it's not just the town anymore. You've got a bunch of different towns, a bunch of different districts, all with varying levels of population how are they, how, who decides who has what voice on the school board? So um, the US Constitution has decided under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment that the one person, one vote concept applies to school boards as well. And there's lots of case law on that. It's very well settled law. Um, so in Vermont, there's three types of proportional representation and you'll see this repeated in the formation because they have to elect initial board members. And then um, you'll see it in the, okay, now we're up and running, it's five years in, we need to appoint a new board member, how do we do that? So this is a concept that will repeat itself. The three different types of the proportional by talent model. 
Um, and Senator, we are um, looking at board member proportionality, which is a handout um, oh, that Daphne has posted. Just a concept to get us going, um, a concept that will repeat itself. <laughs> so the proportional by town, mm -hmm. and please stop me um, if you are not sure where I am or if I'm going too fast. Um, the proportional by town model is achieved at the town level by ensuring the number of seats apportioned to each town is closely proportional to the town's population. The articles of agreement of the board are gonna set out the specific number of seats for each town within the union district based on the most recent census. And you can monkey with that a little bit by weighting votes. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the humans in the seats to achieve the proportionality. No, no. <laughs> this is, this is, we're gonna, we're just, uh, this is just so that it's, it's not gobbledygook when you see it. Yeah. You don't have to master it to understand all of it. Um, but you, you should have an example of that type of waiting. Waiting. So um, if the, if you were going just based on people, and it would be like, let's say uh, town A has uh, three uh, people on the board, town B has three people on the board and town C has one person on the board. Instead of town B having three people on the board, they could maybe have two people on the board, but their votes have to be weighted in such a way so that it's as if they had the same effect of if they have three people on the board. If their weights, their votes would be 1.2? Yes, something. Does that something mean that. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Are we proposing to do that? That's current law. Weighted voting is a current oh, wow. concept. Yep. It's weird. Um, <laughs> It's an option. So all of these are options that um, districts that are forming can um, choose or uh, districts that are currently running or either operating under or at some point in time they may choose to, to change things up. Um, so the important thing kind of to understand about the proportional by town model um, is related to who can be a board member. So the board member must reside in the town to which the seat is apportioned because when you vote for that one person in your town to serve on your school district board, they are representing that town, the voice of that town. It is one town voting for that person. Um, the voters of the town to which the seat is apportioned to sign the nominating petition and only voters of the town um, elect candidates um, that are apportioned to their seats. On the complete opposite end of the spectrum is at large. No towns are apportioned to any town, uh, no seats are apportioned to any town. Any member, any person residing in the district can serve on the board. Um, anyone, any petition, any voter in the district can sign the petition to get someone on the board, and all voters in the district vote on all the seats. At the, in the at large model, if you're sitting on that board, you are presumed to represent the interests of the district as a whole, all of the voters in the district. To further confuse matters, in the middle, <laughs> there's a hybrid option called the modified at large model. This came out of a 1975 Vermont Supreme, uh, nope, actually it was a federal case, 1975. Um, referred to as the Mount Anthony case, where basically there was a lawsuit about board proportionality. Down my way? Yes, Mount Anthony, yep. Um, There's a lawsuit about board proportionality. Someone complained and said, I don't think my, my uh, town is, is being adequately represented by the number of people on our school board. Um, the court said, you're right go back to the drawing board, figure out how to meet the constitutional requirement of one person, one vote in your representation on the school board. And they came back, the school district came back with this hybrid model. The court said, okay, so now it's an option. So the hybrid model is just what it sounds like. It's a mix between proportional by town and at large. The articles of agreement are gonna specify a specific number of seats per town within the union school district. But everyone in the union school district votes on filling those seats. 
And so because everyone's voting on it and any um, uh, and the board member does have to reside in the town that the seat is apportioned to, but everyone votes. And because everyone's voting, it is presumed that that board member is representing the interests of the entire district, which is how we get at the one person, one vote constitutional uh, test. Mm -hmm. Is that clear as mud? <laughs> no, it's yeah, no. very clear. It's like being a senator. Yeah. <laughs> so the, yep. who decides or how is it decided which model is going to be used in the district? So if it's a forming, um, if you're uh, just getting ready to form your district or exploring that, the study committee, mm -hmm. it's going to, all of this is going to be spelled out in the articles of agreement. Okay. Yes, so to be clear to Senator Lyons' point, the senator model is really the at large model, right? The high, the modified, I've never heard of this before, but I'm intrigued. That would be if, say, for example, you had a district with three school districts equally weighted uh, for a Senate comparison, that school district would be, it would have up to two candidates that everybody would vote on, but they would have to reside in that yes. one third of the district. Yes. That's intriguing. Right, it'd be like in your new district that uh, they all all those towns vote on it, but one of them has to live in Willisburg. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. wherever that might be. You can have two. To Very important. <laughs> 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 okay, I mean, the, the articles of incorporation, they call it articles of agreement, mm -hmm. but they're not really agreed on. They're like, here are your articles of agreement. Isn't our articles of agreement in chapter 11? Uh, the th some of the, the concepts and the um, uh, things that need to be in the articles of agreement, yes, that is part of what is in chapter 11. Um, but each each um, school district has their own articles of agreement. And so there, there is variation. Mm -hmm. And does part of that deal with how board members, however they did do it, are reelected or if somebody yes. leaves? Yep. That was all, all spelled out. Hmm. All spelled out. That's why this is so big. Um, you'll see um, if you um, have a chance, I would encourage you to take a uh, just a, a, a breeze through chapter 11 as it stands currently. Just you'll breeze. see <laughs> significantly. I do have a question. Oh. Um, I remember what one of the controversies was that first year I was on in 2019 was that the school board appointed the unified school board member. So Maybe this is only in, when a new district is formed. So there's, which I don't see on here, but maybe that's only because it was when it's newly created when you're doing a study board or something. But, but they were complaining that their select board or their or the old like the, the school board that's going away was electing somebody, so the people of, of the town didn't get a vote. Yes. Yeah, so, well, I uh, you, you said something that threw me off a little bit. So, I think I'm uh, guessing it's just to guess what you're talking about is related to a vacancy um, yeah. in a school district that is already up and running, and just there happens to be a vacancy. How is that vacancy filled? This does address it, and it addresses it by incorporating session law that has been around to address this issue since I believe 2017. And it's in, um, it was in the big bill last year and it sunsets this year. And so what current law says is um, if there's a vacancy in the school board, um, I, I believe that the select board is making an appointment. Um, what the session law says is um, if it's uh, proportional, and this is a very so we probably won't even, uh, well, we'll see. Um, but uh, the way this is organized is we're thinking about it, we're gonna do it, we've already done it. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're in the already done it phase. Right. And so it's at the very end here. And, um, and that's the it's the sole, it's um, this draft says that it is the school board in consultation with the select board that appoints um, the person to fill the vacancy. And then on the, on the first part, mm -hmm. we're thinking about it, if that's okay, mm -hmm. Chair. Yeah, please. Um, who appoint there's a there's a there's I don't know if they call it a school board, but there's a board that forms to prepare to unify. the study committee. And that study committee is or it's either that or the next one when they do it. Is there a part where just the, the existing school boards that will be dissolved appoints people to the board? 
No. So the vote to elect initial members of the Union School District Board is on page 25 of your first chunk. I think that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah. So there's been a study committee. They're interested in forming um, a unified or a union school district. If that interest is successful, there's got to be people to run it, right? So how do we appoint those initial members? So it's section 711, vote to elect initial members of the union um, school district board. So the voters elect the initial members who will serve on the board of the union school district. And then this goes. Um, the voters could be any of those three. Yes, yeah, so it depends on the um, representation model that this new district is going to use on who's doing the, the voting um, and the eligibility of the people to fill those seats. Yes. Does that answer your question? Kind yeah, of? we're good enough for now. I guess we'll okay. This um, section 711 is um, very large and it lays out very specifically. So if you jump to page um, 28, if it's a proposed unified union school district and they are choosing to do the proportional to town population, it spells out exactly um, what needs to be on the petition um, and then who's voting. And then on page 29, it says it gives the same information for the modified at large model. And then on page um, 31, it gives the exact same information for at large representation. And then it goes through it all over again for if it's a proposed union elementary or union high school district. So it really lays it out so that the people who have to do all of this work can go to one place for their specific situation and know that all of that information is there rather than trying to hunt and peck through a bunch of different sections that might apply to their specific situation. Um, so in the, the apportionment piece, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking at page 29 and it says, the board members to the Unified Union School Board uh, elected as a portion based on the town's population. Mm -hmm. So then it says modified at large model. Mm -hmm. Is that fixed within this section of law or does the town fix one of those choices? So why is it sitting there? So this is, so um, let's go back to page 25. Yeah. And look at the um, organization of this specific section. Okay. So it starts by saying at the, the so you, all the voter the voters are going to elect the initial members to serve on the school board at the same time that they're voting on whether or not to form the school the the district. And then um, it says that the um, uh, initial membership on a union school district and the method of member representation has to be set forth in the Articles of Agreement. And then there's some operational definitions um, uh, that help you understand the difference between the town clerk and the district clerk um, and the school. Uh, so that really comes into play when we're talking about who's posting things, who's issuing the warning. Um, that's not as um, that's not clear in current law, and so I believe that was one of the guiding um, uh, philosophies of the Secretary of State's office when they worked on this was making sure that roles are clear and duties are clear. And so we've got those definitions, and then we go into subsection D on page 28. And so this is saying if you're going to you're voting on whether or not to form a unified union school district and then it gives all of the options for the representation models so it's not saying you have to pick one or the other it's saying the voters of each school district identified as necessary advisable which we haven't talked about yet shall vote whether to elect, elect initial board members of the unified union school district as follows and then it gives information on if they picked proportional to town population. And then it, and that goes through page 29, line seven. 
and then we're bumping back out to subdivision two. So that was subdivision one. Subdivision two is now modified at large model. And then and then it keeps going that way. So it's um, it's not telling a school district that they have to use those. It's it's telling them they have to use one of those. It's not telling them which one to pick. And I have that large representation. Mm -hmm. on yep. 31. Page thirty one. So it's all they're all there. And yep, they're all there. And then, it, but that's for a unified union school district. Yes. It goes on on page 32. We start all over again with the same concepts, with just different tweaks depending on whether you're a unified union school district or a union elementary school district. There's, there's different people doing different things. This is not clear. I think we should yeah. start from no, the beginning. Oh, yeah, 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 no, don't don't stay okay. on my list. Okay. Yeah. But I'm sorry yeah. I took us all the way to page 20. You <laughs> took us, you, <laughs> did, you did this. Yeah, did. Anyway, <laughs> that's how it's that's how it's organized. So there's a yeah. lot of repetition. Right. Um, but that's where those concepts first yes. appear. So the opening of this, uh, Elizabeth, you said this is the non-controversial. I'm curious, from your very cautious perspective, how do you use that term, and why would you argue that this is non-controversial and the others might be more controversial? Um, without any, um, I'm just the the person who gives you legal advice. I'm not a policy person. Sure. Um, this is almost all entirely current law. The withdrawal sections and there's there's changes in here there's there's changes that were made by house ed as yeah. policy changes um and there are there's additional information in there to clarify um like roles of who's doing what is there someone who has to drive around to each town to post something mm -hmm. or can they disseminate it to the people in the towns to post it um uh so there's 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 reorganization there's additional detail there's clarity added mount the mount anthony case most of these statutes were in 1960s the mount anthony case came in 75. so it's updated a little bit the withdrawal section the chunk is all brand new law. all brand new law um it's almost 4 30. we can we can um we're on page one <laughs> Half the you tell me if when it, because we have a 4 45 stop you tell me when it's right I i'm fine going with, with always stopping early if it's the right time yes yeah, i have another overarching i'm yeah. going to look okay. through the the outline yep. if i see it do we need statute anymore about what the people that didn't like it called forced mergers is that we you know if that was actually 46 mm -hmm. is that still in chapter 11 or is that somewhere else or so, do we didn't need it anymore so um what donna was talking about related to act 46 is the vast majority so act 46 did a lot of things mm -hmm. what donna was talking about regarding the incentives uh, the, the kind of phases the incentives the studies um, and then the State Board of Education action at the very end there, which you have this yeah. nice map to yeah. Yeah. show you. Um, the vast majority of that is session law, so it's not in Chapter 11. Okay. What The way Chapter 11 and Act 46 interact is you'll see in Act 46 when there is a talk about union uh, districts getting together and exploring merging under Act 46 direction, it's all pursuant to chapter 11. The procedures and the process that they have to follow was all, the only reference in current law was chapter 11. Chapter 11 at that time, and still today as we sit here, hasn't really been updated since the 60s. Donna's right, there have been small updates here and there, and Donna would know best, she was probably here for most of those updates. Um, but the vast majority of it um, was written back when there wasn't uh, there <laughs> the weren't interest. a lot of union school districts and there's nothing in the law now that we where the, we would need the board to rule on a force merger like uh, that was so that was required that everybody to do that, that work happened. to see about it but that happened that's done it's not gonna happen again unless we change all well, I, it's, there's nothing in current law that is asking the State Board of Education to force districts to merge. Um, 
what chunk two will look at is what happens if someone wants to leave a union school district and that is has heavy state board of education sure. involvement. Okay. Yep. Is that clear though about um, Act 46 being um, really session law to get to a place? Um, and the, the place that, that the legislature wanted people to get to, the only mechanism and law they had to guide them there was Chapter 11. And the only law to govern how they are currently operating is Chapter 11, currently. Um, I think maybe what would be helpful for today, and then you can think about what you want to do next, is to just really look at the outline really quick. Um, they don't have this in like a coloring book. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried. <laughs> I think the I think the outline is the easiest. Okay. I okay. I went through this with yeah. House Ed line by line. I'm happy to do that with you. Uh huh. Um, I like the outline, but then what? The outline. Great. Right. Yeah. The outline is just a little easier. So the, this is the outline of the entire bill. Um, oh. Okay, so I only just want to make sure I'm going to the back to the right one. Oh yeah, outline. Outline with page, page numbers. Okay. Yep. yep. So this will correspond to Great. the whole bill that you have. Great. Great. Mm -hmm. um, so section one, so it currently in chapter 11, there's um, two sections, 50, 571 and 572. They are about um, contracts between districts to operate schools jointly and contracts to construct um, and operate joint schools. That was just, yep, you're in the right place. Yep, um, that was just, um, that's currently in chapter 11. It doesn't really seem to have anything to do with how a union school district is formed or run. And so the first section of this act just redesignates those sections to the to the chapter above chapter 11, which is chapter nine. So that's, that's what the first section is doing. Your outline is, in, sorry. Is it wrong? Yeah, it says redesignation. So oh, I was just okay, wondering great. if that's a word I never heard of before. It's not, okay. thank right. you. <laughs> um, half hour in, already a blaring <laughs> typo. <laughs> thank you. Um, I will You're fix doing that. Um, section two is a repeal of current chapter 11. Mm -hmm. And then section three, is chunks one and chunks two. It's just the complete rewrite of chapter 11. And then sections four, five, six, and seven are the session law. And then section eight is your effective date. Sure. Yeah, please. So if we do spend the most of our free time if we do this, I know that some things are highlighted. In, in oh, here. in this, yep. And is that That's where the House made some Correct. something okay. worth noting. Is that why it's highlighted? Correct. That's where they made policy. That's um again, I would highly recommend you get your hands on the AOE policy document. Donna could probably shoot it over there yeah, right now. She's listening. <laughs> Donna, would you mind doing that? I think she's happy to. I'll pull it up right now and send it to Daphne. Okay, yeah, thank you. Sure oh, I see. This is good. Yeah, and knowing where they made yeah. changes. Yeah. And I will, I have, um, and I'm, I'm happy to give this to you guys, but it's right now, it's just mine, but I have an annotated version with all of where a current law is. Like a teacher's edition. Exactly. <laughs> um, so it, as we look at sections, I can point out this comes from here or there. There is new stuff in here. I don't want to say that it's just the words that are currently on the books regurgitated in here. Okay. The concepts are all the same. Got it. They might have been rewritten for clarity or detail added or reorganized, mm -hmm. but the vast majority of this is found in current law. And then those highlighted sections are correspond to some policy changes that House had made. Of course, there's not a lot. No. Nope. Um, you'll see that the organization, so if we're looking at chunk one in the context of the outline, you'll see that it's organized by just how I started. Um, so there's a kind of a, there's a policy section um, that is the same as current law with the addition of adding the goals of Act 46 to it. 
Um, <clears throat> there's a definition section. Current chapter 11 has one definition in its definition section. Um, this bill proposes um, several new definitions to again, provide clarity to roles and who are we talking about here. Um, and then it jumps right into, we're gonna propose, uh, we're gonna explore, we're gonna form and we're gonna organize. So how does a study committee, uh, a, a school, a union school district is created with different school districts talking to each other and trying to decide if they wanna merge into one school district. And the way they do that is through a study committee. And so um, subchapter two in chapter 11, um, is about that study committee process. How does it form? Who's on it? Budget and membership, how do we figure that out? Um, and then if it's, if it's an existing Union Elementary or Union High School District wanting to form a unified Union School District, what does that look like? If it is an existing unified union school district wanting to um, form an a even larger unified union school district, what does that look like? Um, that's how specific this gets for each possible scenario that could be out there. There's a there's a, um, a section in here that addresses that specific. So. Um, so, so there's something specific for each um, scenario. Cool. Yes, there's one scenario you'll see in the proposed policy document. There's one scenario, um, actually, I don't know if it's in the policy document or I just, it was from conversations with Donna. I think you could devolve and create scenarios forever yeah. and then you would have a million page bill. And so my understanding, and Donna can correct me anytime I'm wrong, is um, that this was written with, the eye to what AOE has seen and has been experiencing since all of these mergers have happened. What are the most common scenarios that they have seen? Does the study committee do anything except the merger? The no, in announce? fact. So, I mean, so it's called the study committee. Would it make sense to call it a merger study committee? A merger study committee. Just because that's what it does. Does anybody think about that, talk about that? It did not come up renaming the study committee. Things matter. Yeah, I mean, it makes it, for me, it's simpler if you just say it's the merger study committee. It's not the other study committee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a lot of study committees. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it goes on to talk about the study committee budget because that's a lot of work to do all of this. Yes. And um, that was one of the policy changes that was made. Current law says the study um, it talks about um, if the budget is above or below a certain threshold, does it need to go to the voters? Um, and current law is 25,000. And there was a policy decision made to bump that up to 50,000. Um, but section 707 talks about what counts towards your study committee budget. Um, and this, there is some additional information in there based on um, things that AOE has experienced and that's additional costs and grants. Um, it addresses subsequent appointments of persons to the study committee and a vacancy on the study committee, formal participation in the study committee, um, additional formal participants and informal participation. Um, a lot of um, the, the, so the study committee is looking at whether to create a union school district. And so there has to be two towns at least involved, right? It's two or more towns. Um, and so uh, the formal participants in the study, there are formal participants in the study committee who have members, voting members in the study committee who are contributing to a budget. Um, it's possible that after the study committee is going, they realize that there are other towns or school districts that should be added. And so there's a section that addresses how do we get additional people onto the study committee. And then it's possible that there are districts who maybe the study committee doesn't really think they're necessary and maybe the school district itself doesn't really think it's necessary but they just want to cover all their bases there's a section that addresses informal participation by other school districts so that's how detailed yeah. um, this is getting um, 
And then section 708 is about the study committee process. What do they do? What is their deliverable? Um, it talks about necessary and advisable school districts. I'm at the bottom of page two on the outline. Um, again, a necessary school district is necessary to that formation. The, the study committee has decided this union school district can only work if these necessary school districts join for whatever reason that is. They may also find that there are school districts that they would love to have join them, but if they don't join, the school district is still going to be able to form and function. And those yeah. school districts are called advisable school districts. And so section 708 subsection subdivision B1, um, B1 and 2 address the necessary and the advisable school yeah. districts. Um, <clears throat> There's um, so in this mm -hmm. in the in the study committee and it says process page mm -hmm. 16 that is only the the study of what the process would be or how it will play out. I mean it's not it isn't the actual process or is it? Yep, so let's look at page 16. Okay. So it gets real granular here. Sure. Who okay. even convenes the study committee meeting? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, uh, down at Rooster Savage, do you want to add something? Um, no, I had asked, I had asked to say something at the very, very end that I had forgotten that is not about this. I'm sorry that that wasn't clear. Um, the, so uh, we start with who, how do we, how do we even get everyone going and on the same yeah. page? Mm -hmm. The superintendent shall be in a study committee of the first meeting. Um, and then it talks about what to do if there's more than one supervisory union involved. Um, it, uh, page 17, the staff of the supervisory union shall provide administrative assistance and AOE shall make their staff available to provide technical assistance and make sure everyone knows that the study committee is a public body and so open meeting law applies. Um, it talks about whether um, uh, just a majority of the committee members present in voting um, uh, are all that is necessary for a committee decision. Um, and then it goes into, so that's the process to kind of get everyone going. And then it goes into necessary and advisable school districts. Um, um, mm -hmm. If there's more than one supervisory in which superintendent are we talking about? Well, it says the staff of the supervisory union or unions. So it, it's contemplated that either or both. Okay. So the superintendent that calls the first meeting. Um, the, if the participating, so we're on page 16, lines 20 through 21. If the participating districts are members of more than one supervisory union, then the superintendents themselves oh, shall decide. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I move that this is too complicated and we just merge everybody into one school district. We've already had that. <laughs> that that suggestion. I have an overall at 60. Yeah, that's probably, I think that's probably a good spot to end on. I don't know if Donna has any, or if this came up at all. The one thing that I hear from uh, constituents that have that are still have lingering bitterness about the whole process is about the goals. You know, in the waiting study that we heard, we set up uh, an audit to look back, and people said that was never done with Act 46. And I don't know if if it was ever done or if there's ever talk of doing that. So, like, so when Act 46 was passed, there was all this talk about why we need to do it. Several people say that never happened, or there was at least, at the very least, no an an analysis of whether it did or didn't. And so I don't know if that came at all came up. But this was just so about rewriting the wording and about withdrawal that probably didn't come up, and maybe they wanted to avoid those taking those band aids off. But did that ever come up, or has there been a talk of that? Um, I think there have been comments here and there about was Act Forty Six effective. I will tell you that um, because 
current law was written in the 60s. Um, there's no reference to Act 46, obviously, mm -hmm. but this bill does make reference to the goals of Act 46. It's written into the policy section, and there are several places throughout where the State Board of Education has to make a finding. Um, and uh, there's a reference back to the policy section, which includes the goals of Act 46. So the goals of Act 46 are woven throughout this now in this draft. Um, I would, um, I wasn't here when Act 46 was written, um, but yeah. Donna was. Um, so I think she might be the best person to answer about conversations back then. But to my knowledge, there has not, nothing was contemplated for this rewrite to um, do any sort of analysis on the effectiveness of Act 46. Effectiveness towards the goal. So it'd be, I mean, it's kind of interesting, right? Would, I mean, and, and maybe it's even, because as, as the dust settles and yeah. the districts operate, maybe in two more years, three more years, should there be a look back at those goals, especially if we're still referring to them, and say, that's how it all go. Yeah. So, yeah. and I know I was thinking about the audit today as well and wondering who, who is tar charged with performing the audit? In the waiting system, the auditor. It is the no. This. There is no audit. There, there's no audit in here. Oh. I was just thinking since we talked about it yeah, I was today, thinking I was about thinking, the waiting study. Okay. Yeah, and I was thinking about that was a complaint I heard a lot. Okay. That there's, there was a lot of promises made about the goals and how this would meet it, but did they do That's it? That's so difficult. How would you do that on a statewide basis? I mean, you have to do it by district by district to get the data and analysis. Right. And you'd have to, you'd have to figure out what metrics are. It would be a project. A big project. And, and, you know, so yeah. we would put it a few years out, I would think. Right. But something to think about. I can think about. Yeah. Thank you. John, did you want to make some final comments on this at this point? I, I had, oops, wait a sec. Ah. <laughs> yeah. I had one, it, it's not related to what Beth was just saying, but it was something that I had meant to mention before when I was giving you the overview. And that is, is there, there is one uh, aspect that is not included in this bill. It was something that we started to become aware was an issue pretty much as, as we were starting to help the um, house education work through this um, proposal. And Technically, it was so complicated that they said, why don't you guys all go back to the drawing board and think about it and think what might be best and suggest it to the Senate and the Senate can take it up. And what it is, is that um, when Act, well, even before Act 46, when Act 153 was enacted, um, the legislature realized that if you transition from a single district school district with contracts with employees, to a unified union school district with employees, even if they're the same people, how do you transition employees? How do you transition contracts? You know, what, what happens in that transition? And language was put in to deal with, uh, deal with that, with mergers, either mergers into larger school districts or mergers of supervisory unions. And it became apparent as the state board was working with some of the districts who are seeking to withdraw that there's no comparable statute that deals with what happens if a town that has a little tiny elementary school wants to withdraw and wants to keep its um, its current the teachers who are currently there and those teachers would like to stay there is there a way that the the, the contracts tra can transfer or you know what will happen so you don't need to be thinking about the details about this at all right now. I just wanted to let you know that there is this piece that I've been working on the, with the stakeholders um, that is is complicated only because we had to try to think of all the possible situations that could come up. And I've sent something out to them. I'm hoping for responses. And as soon as anything is in readable form, we'll get it to you so that you can consider it. Thank you. And I'm sorry. <laughs> So uh, I'm suggesting, I mean, I know people's time is, is tight, but if people do have any opportunity to kind of go through some of this at least before we pick it up tomorrow, I think it would be helpful. And we're really, we'll, we'll do that. Let's we'll start again tomorrow, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. And we'll, Daphne will work with you to set up times
for next week as well. Yep. So this it actually does make sense. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's a big one. <laughs> yeah. I feel like they've all been big this year. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. 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 Okay. We're adjourned.